Okay, let's go deep. Right then, in this video, I'm going to try and answer a question, right, which was um, how do you handle deep bowls? Uh, I can actually explain the question clearer when we get to the inside of this, uh, but basically it's, the person who asked me the question was having a problem when they came down into the bottom of the bowl and went across, um, they were coming off the bevel all the time. Even if they went high and came down, they were still coming off the bevel. Right, I'll show you how to start that out. It's actually a grind on a till that starts it out. Right, uh, in here I have a piece of white oak that I think is 11 across and five and a half deep. Um, this problem only really happens with deep bolts. Right, so we'll, uh, we'll get on with this, get through the outside of it as quick as I can. All right, uh, do the arthritis grip bit which is another legend this week. And then uh, we'll tackle the inside and I'll go through how to start it out. Right, so the first thing I'm gonna do is round it off because as I said, this is white oak. It's been through the kiln. I carved it and rough torn it a few months ago. And uh, as you can see, it's warped out as they always do. Right, so we'll get this started and uh, then we'll get on with the answering the question of the deep problem. Right, the first thing I'm going to do is round off the rim as normal, right? And as normal, I'm going to go the wrong direction. really warped off well off to one side and it's because of the spalting on one side it's contracted more so this roll is going to be a lot smaller than it is now nearly there there to there I have to do cut there now right you can see how much this ball has warped it's quite big right so we'll take this down and I'll just keep going on this because there's not going to be much to do with this until I get it taken down Right, and this still has a huge warp in it, just there. I'm not hitting that area at all. So I'm going to take a cut going the wrong direction just to get that warp out of it. Because the pull cut is taking too long, basically. I see the wrong direction actually. Right. We 
like this being kiln dried white oak. If you can imagine it's rock hard and it's blunting the tool extremely quickly. So I'm gonna have to sharpen this again. Right, let's just get this rounding off part finished. Now we start worrying about neating it up and getting the proper shape into it. Right. There isn't bad shape boys, but that curve there needs to be more. So we'll work on that a bit. The tail rest a little, because I'm going to be cutting it this way. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, that bottom part's all right now. We move up a bit. See that line just there, that's what I'm trying to get rid of. Could be quite pretty there. It's a bump just there. Finish up with a push cut. there I need to take out so so I will take that out
Yep. We just start out up here at the rim. This is a few couple of tool marks just there. Back in a second. This is the package being delivered. Right, I'm happy enough with that shape. Uh, right, what I want to get to is the inside of this ball as quick as I can, because that's what the question was. But uh, right, what I'll do is I'll uh, sand and finish the outside of the ball now. I'll be back for the Arthur Group bit of course, which I said is another Irish legend. And. Um, This week's one is the one that British people used to fear most. So, I'll be back in a minute. Alright then, this week's Yorkshire Grip bit. As I said, it was uh, it's one of the most feared legends in Ireland. And you'll actually be surprised at how far this one went a few times. Right, it's a changeling. Right. A changeling is a fairy that has been left in place of a baby unbeknownst to the parents. Right? Now, the fairies, the various reasons for doing this. One, according to the legend, is they love the sound of a child's laughter. Right? Uh, they also love the purity of a child. Uh, and if the child was an exceptional beauty, the fairies would steal the child and replace it with one of their own so that they could possess that beauty. Uh, the fairy that was left was either a fairy child or a sick fairy or a fairy that was reaching the end of its life. Now, depending on which version of the legend you hear, the fairy that, the fairy that had been left can look exactly like the child that was taken and only the behaviour would change. Right. Now, when this myth was believed, an awful lot of what we would now categorise as medical conditions were blamed on the fairies. Stuff like autism, ADHD, dwarfism, a speech impediment, blindness, any, basically anything that was wrong with a child was blamed on the fairy, right. Now, while I was checking this one up, I was down the library reading a really old book and I found a description of a changeling child and what they were supposed to look like if they didn't look exactly like the child that was taken, right? And this is it. Uh, the changeling would be small a feature with an impish face and ears that come to a small point. Right? The eyes will seem to be torn up at the corners and will be green or the deepest blue you can imagine. Uh, the changeling's appetite was unwavering, but no matter how much they ate, they would not grow in height and the child would always, always be sickly. Uh, the changeling will also seem like a happy child as it knows, it's it's convinced the human parents that it's their child, and they know they're basically going to have an easy life until it gets called back to the fairies. And what will happen is it get called back to the fairies when it has grown, and the parents basically will forget they ever had a child um, but they'll know there's something missing but they don't they just won't know what it is um, they, they'll have no idea what's missing they'll just have this feeling that something is missing and that feeling will stay with them for the rest of their lives right. now in saying all that all changes were not children if a fairy mother died, 
then the fairies may take a human woman to rear the baby, to rear the fairy child, to rear the baby baby, right? Uh, now, when they did this, the fairy that went in was always either an old fairy or a fairy that was dying. Right now, there's actually a documented case of this one. Right, it's from 19 hours from 1895, and there was a man called Michael Cleary and his wife Bridget Cleary. Right. Now, Michael got it into his head that his wife had been replaced with a changeling, and he was so convinced of this, he killed his wife, right. believing that he wasn't actually killing his wife but he was killing the evil fairy that had been left in her place. Right? Now, this went to court and he got 20 years in jail for doing it. Now, there's a full, actually, story printed of this and Wiki have it and I'll stick a link down below. It's actually, it's, it's a really interesting read. But these changelings were the most feared thing in Ireland. Like there was countless, countless children who were killed um, because of because people believed that they would have been replaced by a changeling. Apparently, the normal way they used to do it was they wouldn't actually physically kill the child, but they would bring the child out into the forest. Right, normally as a baby and leave the child there for the fairies to take back in hopes that they would get their own child back and uh, as I said it's it was one of the most feared things when these legends were being believed right uh, you know, as I said I will leave a link below to that Michael Cleary story but uh, this one just kind of goes to prove how believed these stories actually were about the legends and stuff over here right, that there was actually people killed because of them right so I'll get on with this and I'll be back when I'm waxing it right so I'll uh, see you in a few minutes Right then, just buffing the wax off. Uh, white oak is probably my favourite native wood to work with because I think it's just a stunning wood, especially if it's like this. Excuse me, especially if it's like this, where it's been spalted a little bit. I think it's absolutely stunning wood. But uh, the thing is, if you run it through, if you do what I do and rough torn it and put it in the kiln, it ends up rock hard which is probably why some people don't like working with it but I think that is just a beautiful wood altogether with the wax in the well, fire needs to be buffed again there Said, I think that is a beautiful wood. The graining in it. Look at that, it's a there. There's no one of their marks, is there? Particular. Right. Get that another buff. Finger test. Not getting any pulling anywhere. There we go. Yeah. That is absolutely gorgeous. As I said, it's my favourite uh, native wood to use. Right now, we'll get on to the middle of this and uh, try and answer the question. Right now, now, the first thing I'm going to do is 
level off that room, of course. Get the speed down a bit to 800. Cut. Am I? No, I'm not just there. I said this one worked a lot in the kill. Right, now I can get clean entries. Great. Let's get this tire stuck out of the way. Right now, what I'm going to do is take the kink out of this. Right. Right. Let's just check that the kink is completely gone. It should be. It is. Right, now I'll get to the width of the ball that I want. Which is round about there. Chipping out. Yeah, I need to sharpen this gouge. I'm getting chips. It's slightly chipping out on the inside. Load the coat way down. Clean there. Right, I'm indeed. Right, now we just get the hollow and some more of this. Yeah, right, now let's go to another sharp and get a finished cut on that part. Nice finish cut here. Yeah, much nicer. Yep. Right, now we keep going. And I've still got imbalance here in the bowl. So I've got to get all that out before I can go to the uh, other gouge. Yeah, with as good. There's a big crack in this. You see it? Just there. Big internal crack in this. Hopefully I can get it out. Looks like it's coming in to the edge of the bowl there. Although I have a bit of meat there, I can try and cut that out a little bit more.
everything out. Not in particular, right? I'm gonna have to put some CA into that crack because it's not coming out. This is what I've always said about when you're working with wood, you never know what's inside, so be careful. That crack was not showing on the outside of this at all, and it's a pretty wide crack. I'll just reinforce it with CA for the moment, make sure it doesn't split. Right. Now we get back to it. Touch the sides, which I'm not. Right. Look at that crack. It's there, but it's sealing. Right now we start taking some more out of the middle of this. And sharply goes again. Right now, we're down under that crack at the finished width and it's still there so I'm gonna have to fill that crack properly before I go anywhere else There's another one down in the base here, but I knew about that one. Now we're nearly getting to where I have to use the other gouge, which is down at the bottom down there. Yeah, let's have a look here. See if we can cut out that crack. And that crack might need filling as well. So I've still a lot of meat there. So hopefully I can cut it out. Now I'm going down so far where Right, turn it off for this. Right, if I want to keep my edge, I'm going to hit there. Right, if I want to keep that bevel on there, I'm going to hit there. So now I have to change to a different gouge because I'm, I can't get the angle I need to keep the bevel. Right, and what I'm going to switch to is a bottom feeder. This is my bottom feeder. Now, right, I use the Thompson because of the length of the handle. It gives me a lot of control. Right, now the difference between a bottom feeder and a standard gouge, okay? Right. That is my normal bevel. Down there at the bottom. Right. Do you see the gap between the top of the ruler and the gouge? I'm hoping the camera is catching this. Right. right. That's my normal angle. That's the angle that's on this gouge. Right, it's nearly flat, but it's not quite flat. Which means the bevel I'm going to ride is this one. Right, this nearly straight one. 
what that will do for me is when I go in I can keep the tool out here rather than having to hit off the side here and I can go across the bottom riding the bevel whereas if I use my normal gouge right, in order to ride the bevel the tools here right, that's the difference between the two of them that's on the bevel there the Thompson's on a bevel and the crown is on a bevel but you can see the difference of where they are right. so in answer to the question that I was given about handling deeper bowls that grind there is the answer it's as I said it's almost straight and as I said I use the crown because it gives me or I use the Thompson because the long handle gives me control and the thing is with one of these it's a lot slower of a cut You only have a slower, you only have a smaller cutting surface. Where's that crack? And another one is starting to appear just there. Take some of this stuff away with a back hollow. Now I couldn't back hollow like this with my own gouge, with the normal gouge, because I wouldn't be near a bevel. I wouldn't be anywhere near as close to the bevel. To riding the bevel doing it. And she's blunt. Now we'll check that crack again. What was it? Now I'm gonna have to take it off and treat that crack. So I'll do that and be back in a sec. Right then, there's that crack all treated. Hopefully it doesn't go much deeper. Now we're back to the micro bevelling. As I said, the trick with these the bottom feeders is small, shallow pull. Especially if you're used to using an Irish grind. You're used to having a joint cutting edge. Sure, at the age of a tiny cutting edge. There, it's gone blunt again. So they got blunt very quick as well, because they're only small. Being small, they're very sharp, they're very quickly sharpened up. Get the last of this. I think that crack is still showing up because I can feel it. Yeah, 
head is still there. That's it. I could feel that hitting the gouge. But I want to get rid of that lump there first. And then what I'll do is I'll fill the crack again and I'll do it with the negative brake scraper because I don't want to be taking any more off that because it's quite close. But I don't want that bump in the middle. So I'll get rid of that. Still slightly there. With the, with the slow, shallow cuts. Right, bump's gone. Right, I will fill that crack and hit it with the negative brake scraper to take the CA off and take out any tool marks. And uh, I'll be back when I'm doing that. Okay, right, I've just put an edge on the negative brake scraper, checked that the cutting edge is smack on the center. In close. Right. And there we go. That looks like it's finally filled mostly. Right. Yeah, it looks like it's not finally filled mostly. I might have to put slight sawdust into it. So we get a sanding and finishing the inside of this, and we'll be back in a sec. Right then, just buffing the wax off. Uh, turned out quite nice. Now, as I said, I hope that's answered the question of deep bowls. Now, I will freely admit I am not the best with that tool. I very rarely use it. But the principles of it, I know. Uh, which is the more acute angle. Some people call it a micro bevel. And that uh, frequent sharpening. Okay. And very, very light cuts because it won't take a heavy cut. I said, I must use that tool maybe. It's not very often I do bowls this shape. I probably use that tool two, three times a year. Out of the a few hundred balls to do a year and all the and all the other stuff. But uh, as I said, I'm not I free you I'm not the best with that tool, so because it's one I don't use very often. Right, you see the way that flipped out in there? That means that wax in the middle is not buffed out yet. If you've seen the um, my finishing video because it's one of my most requested ones. If you haven't seen it I'll leave a link up there to it. Uh, I explained why that happens and that it's one of the tests to see that it's still catching a little. It's one of the tests to see if you've buffed fully yet or not. One thing, uh, flip down again. So we're still not buffed in the middle there. It's very low pressure, just hold it there. Okay. Till it's just there we go, one finger skids. 
now it's more properly because it's scared with just one finger hole in it. Yep. It's getting away there. Just the one finger holding it there. Right then, let's have a look at this. Oh, that turned out nice in there. As I said, it's uh, white oak, it's one of my favourites to work with. Right, I'll flip this over, take the tenon off, and give you a better look at it. So, I'll be back in a sec. Right, there we have it. A, I'm not actually sure what size I ended up. In a sec. Ten and a half, maybe. No, let's call it ten by five. Right, a ten by five white oak bowl, deep bowl. Uh, quite pretty. Love the markings in it. Uh, and as I said, that's an answer to a question of how do you ride the bevel on a deep bowl or how do I cut better on a deep bowl and the trick is that bevel it's the secondary bevel which is a lot sharper uh, but the things with it is small tiny cuts sharpen it often right? you might get two or three cuts before you have to sharpen it because it's so small um, especially if you're using something that's rock hard like this oak right? Uh, so I hope you enjoyed that one. If you wouldn't mind giving the video a thumbs up. And I'll see you in the next one.